Brothers and sisters, if I can have your attention, I want to make a, a big announcement. It's about to get so packed in this church that we're not going to have enough room. And so Sunday morning, I was down in the aisle trying to help people find seats. And we had a new family come in, and two of them were in the back and two of them were at the front. So I'm going to ask your help. I think we had like 30 or 40 out Sunday sick, and it was still packed. Sister Christina was up in the balcony. What did we have, about 20 people up there? We had a pretty good group up in the balcony. And so I'm just going to ask you to be attentive and considerate to our new ones or our guests when they walk in. If you can quickly be willing to give up your seat. We don't have assigned seating around here. And so if you quickly be willing just to scoot in or whatever it is we have to do, we may not run into it too much. To, uh, you know what? We might run into it tonight. I see them filing in. Amen. So I just wanted to make that quick announcement. But the big news is this. It's about to get so full. Brother Ludwig said we're going to have to call other ships from other places to come handle the catch. I think we ought to open a night with an extended hand clap of praise. Do you have enough energy on Wednesday night to clap your hands for 30 seconds? Why do we clap our hands? Because the shackles are no longer on our arms. But we've been set free by the blood of the Lamb. Did you run out of energy? Go ahead, put those hands together. We're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Lift up your voice with a shout of victory as Sister Sanders comes to lead us in song tonight.
world that still believes Jesus is coming soon. Scripture says, comfort one another with these words. And so I'm excited. I'm looking forward to that day. It feels good in the house of the Lord. I'm going to let you be seated tonight. I'd like for Brother Sergio Lopez to come. He has been in Chiapas down in the area that he's from for the past couple weeks. I think he left uh, New Year's Eve somewhere in the night. And uh, we were able to help to uh, fund that trip. Not the whole trip, but some of the trip. And uh, I want him to come and give her a report. He's got an amazing report of some things that God's doing down there. It kind of started with a group in his family. I'll let him tell you more about it, but it's kind of spreading out. Praise the Lord, church. I'm kind of nervous, so hopefully I don't run out of English, okay? <laughs> Amen. God is working in, in my life and my, uh, my family we went, I went down there, and I said we because I felt all the bucket from Pentecostal Tabernacle. I, we had three nights of revival there with, with the, the president of the uh, UPC in Mexico. And you know what? It was kind of dry in the spirit. Maybe they were new for the, in the Holy Ghost. I don't know. But in my mind, I knew that I had the bucket from Pentecostal Tabernacle. I knew that the prayers of a few guys were, were with me in Mexico. And you know what? We have four baptized in Jesus' name. One sister received the Holy Ghost. Yes. It was one prayer night. That... That's IBC, bro. <laughs> I think we ought to take a 30-second praise break for four baptized and one in the Holy Ghost. So I want, I want all of Mexico and I want all of hell and all of heaven to know we're winning. And we just keep on winning because we're on the Lord's side. Somebody give God a hand clap of thanksgiving. It was this one night that, that we were praying and, and the sister told me she's, she's one of the, the ones in the mission. And she said, you know what? I feel something. I, I want to say something, but I don't know. I feel this in my heart and... It feels like burning in my heart. And I say, you know what? Next time it happens to you, just raise your hands and, and say whatever you want. But maybe you are not going to understand. And, she's, and I said, one of the things that you, you have to do is don't be afraid. Don't, don't, don't let fear enter into your mind. And she, we, were, we started praying. And she raised her hands. And, and then all of a sudden, she, she was filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. We went to visit, we went to visit my uncle. He, he, he got some in some kind of witchcraft. I don't know. Some, somebody put a curse on him. And he started spending his money. He saw all he had for, because he, was, uh, he has been looking for a, a doctor to, to heal him and everything. And then one day, that day we came because somebody told us that he was already dying. And you can, you can see his pictures. And he's a, like a really tough guy. You know, Mexicans are kind of tough though. Not me though. I'm more like, I'm more this side now. But we got there, and, and he said, you know what? I spent all my money. Uh, you, can, you can see all his bones. And, and uh, he was all so skinny. And he said, I tried everything. But you know what? I just gave up. And I said, you know what? We have something better. It's called Jesus Christ. And I said, if you repent of your sins, God is going to forgive you. If you want to get baptized in Jesus' name, we can baptize you tonight. And he said, you know what? Find something. Find something. I want to get baptized. We couldn't find anything that night, brother. We had to come back next time with something, with some kind of container. He got baptized. My tia got baptized too. And I believe God is going to keep working there. Hallelujah. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. I think we ought to rejoice at that good Holy Ghost report. Where's Brother Juvie Martinez? He's behind me. Hey, what's happening in the bilinguals already flowing out? Brother Ludwig said it uh, on Monday night that the waters issued forth from the threshold of the temple. 
I believe that the waters are flowing from this church. But when Brother Sergio went down, out of his belly were flowing rivers of living water. I'm telling you that everywhere you go, the water's going to flow. And where the water flows, there's going to be fish swimming. Amen. Worship with Sister Sanders as we sing another song. you put your hands together and give the Lord a shout of victory. Hallelujah. We used to sing an old song that said I'm feeling better, so much better since I laid my burdens down. Maybe you're here tonight and you're wondering why everybody is so hyped up and full of energy. It's because we're not in the wilderness anymore. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. When I was growing up in Pentecost, you could tell who the new converts were because of their zeal. And you could tell who the ones that had been a little while since they'd been converted because of their lack of zeal. But we just flipped that upside down, and I'm looking around here. I can't tell if you're new. I can't tell if you've been in it for 30 years. Because there's an atmosphere where everybody's rejoicing. Because we're remembering and we're reminiscing about the good things of the Lord. Amen, amen. God bless you as you make your way to your seats and as our ushers come tonight and uh, as the ushers are coming, I want to remind you that this weekend, Saturday evening, uh, we have service right here at five o'clock 
And we're seeing God do some incredible things in our bilingual service this Saturday night. Brother Juvie Martinez is going to be preaching the word. And so we want to invite you to invite somebody. If they don't uh, speak English or if they prefer Spanish, we want to uh, we want them just to come be a part uh, of service and a fellowship. Sunday morning, we're going to have a powerful time around here. And we have a, uh, a brand new young evangelist named Jonathan Sanders going to come preach on Sunday morning. In Jesus' name, pray that the Lord will help him. And then Sunday night, we're going to have a time in the Holy Ghost. Brother Jordan Prendez from CLC is going to bring the word. It's going to be an exciting time. And on your way out, let's remember donation sheets. We've, uh, they've been filling about half up. Let's go ahead and just fill those up. That helps us just to provide for the food and the fellowship. Uh, Landmark is coming up next week. That's going to, um, that's going to be, I've, I've, you can look on the website and you get all the information because I forgot all the information. Sister Sanders has an announcement. Landmark Ladies' Day. Everyone say Thursday, January 25th. 9.30 a.m., especially the ladies, not so much the men, but of course, he's preaching, so. <laughs> but um, if you're at all able to make it, Landmark Ladies' Day is always a wonderful, wonderful time. It's like a miniature one-day ladies' conference, and it's just incredible, so you don't want to miss that. Central Valley Ladies' Day is going to be taking place on Saturday, February 10th at 10.30 a.m. This is going to be at the Pentecostal Lighthouse in Visalia, and Sister Danielle Cisneros is going to be speaking, and I know her. She's a wonderful, wonderful lady of God. She is a licensed family and marriage therapist. She's been practicing for almost 20 years. It's going to be a wonderful time. You don't want to miss it. And then final announcement. Um, these are all for the ladies, by the way. Uh, Western District Ladies Conference is coming up February 22nd through the 24th. It is at the Visalia Convention Center. You don't want to miss it. Registration is now open. You can go to the Western District Ladies website for more information. Amen. Exciting things ahead for our apostolic ladies. Jesus, I pray over every family that you would open up the windows of heaven and that you would pour out abundant blessings spiritually, financially, on the job, in the home. I pray, Lord, that you will minister to every family, that this will be a special year, a year in which we see the final unfolding of some things that we've been praying for for a long time. We're believing for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you come and give this evening. And as you make your way back to your seats, greet somebody. And at this time, we're going to, to dismiss our young people. And we're going to dismiss our kids to their classes. If you are new to Pentecostal Tabernacle and you don't know where your classes are, just head straight out that door and go right. And one of our teachers can help you to get to the right place. And we'll... Man, it's good to see Sister Jasmine's mom here tonight. I told her, great job, Mom. Sister Jasmine's just one of God's finest. So we're happy you're here tonight. Amen. To all of our guests, we want you to know we're thankful you're here. Thank you for making uh, the effort to come out on a Wednesday night. Amen. Just take a moment and greet somebody, and we'll get in the flow here in just a second. Amen. As you begin to make your way back to your seats, we're going to go to the book of Acts tonight. And uh, if, if I could get, uh, oh, thank you, Brother Enrique, for shutting those doors. I appreciate that. 
Amen. Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to begin in 38. You can be seated. I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture tonight. And I feel like the Lord has given me uh, direction to preach. Amen. I'm thankful for the word of the Lord. I have more in my spirit tonight than I think I'm able to articulate. So I need the Lord to help me. I just feel like God has good things coming in this year. And when I look forward and see such blessing and anointing, it's hard to... The Bible says it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's hard to put it into words. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children. Generational attacks from spirits can end with your generation, and generational blessing can be released beginning with your generation. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, uh, in the 1550s, I believe it was, chapter and verse divisions were implemented into uh, what we know today as our Bible, our King James Version Bible. But before then, there were not chapter and verse divisions. They were added to make it easier for us to search the Scriptures. But Scripture was not necessarily originally meant to be read one chapter at a time. And so when we're reading tonight, we're just going to go right into the third chapter, beginning in uh, Acts 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So it's apparent that this man had been laying at the gate of this temple uh, as a beggar for uh, some extensive period of time, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, temple asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And the man, he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. This man was looking for material substance. But Peter had something that was not material substance, but it was spiritual blessing. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have... Give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Verse 7, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately, somebody say immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with him into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. Let's skip down to verse number 19 and read Acts 3, 19 through 21. This is in the context of Peter that is ministering, and he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Right here in Acts 3.21, many translations use the word restoration rather than restitution, another word for restitution is the restoration of all things. And so we have a progression here that we have just read. 
In Acts chapter 2, we have first the restoration of salvation. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 7, we have the restoration of a man's body, his life, his legs. And finally here in Acts 3.21, we have the full restoration of all things in the kingdom of God. There are many who experience the restoration of salvation, but they don't yet experience the restoration of healing that comes after salvation. But there are three dimensions of restoration that God brings to the life of a believer. It is first, the restoration at new life of salvation, that Acts 2.38 experience. Second, after you come in, God's going to heal you, and He's going to convert and heal your mind. And then finally, there are a few that experience full restoration to the point of kingdom ministry. And so from th these three dimensions of restoration tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the restoration of all things. The restoration of all things. Now, to begin tonight, I would submit to you that the physical healing of this man who was lame at the gate beautiful, a man who by all appearances had been lying there for some time. He knew what time to get there at the hour of prayer. He knew how to capitalize on the moment because how can you go in and pray before God if you are hard-hearted? And so he was capitalizing, no doubt, upon the sympathies of the believers as they were walking into the temple at the hour of prayer. And this particular account, I don't believe, was simply about the healing of a man's lame legs, but in fact, this man's healing and this account was for the purpose of preparing the people for a message that right after his healing, God would bring to them through the preacher of Pentecost, the great apostle Peter. And so we see Simon Peter preaching not only in Acts chapter 2, but we see him again preaching to the people in Acts chapter number 3. Thrust into the center of attention, Peter and John. Peter was quick when people began to see this lame man get up and walk. That's not something that you see every day. And so they were thrust into the center of attention. And immediately Peter was quick to turn the glory to the Lord and to turn the minds and the curiosity of the people towards God. And he said in Acts 3 and 12, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though it were by our power or holiness that made this lame man walk. He was saying, don't look at me because it's not by my power, but it's by a greater power that healing has come to this man's body today. And it was from the foundation of this miracle that Simon Peter thrust into the spotlight, began to preach, and he had one message to preach. It was the message of the restoration of Jesus Christ. He focused on the restorative power of Jesus. And Peter called Jesus in Acts 3.15, the Prince of Life, pointing at the restorative power of Jesus to bring the dead in their trespasses and sins to newness of life. And then... He says that Jesus is he whom God raised from the dead. Again, referring to the restorative power of God in this Messiah, Christ Jesus. In verse 16, preaching this theme of restoration, Peter tells those listening how it happened. He says, you know this man, how he was lame from his birth. No doubt they had seen him at the gate of the gate beautiful of the temple for a long time. But Peter said, 
The difference today is that faith in the name of Jesus has made this man strong. He's speaking of the restorative power of Jesus when you release your faith to connect with him. And he says again, speaking of this rest restoration power that Jesus has given this man perfect health in your presence. And so I don't believe that this man's healing in and of itself was the entirety of the focal point of what happened that day, but he was just an actor in a greater message and drama that was going to begin to unfold. There was a greater purpose for this moment. The miracle was merely an illustration to show the people that Jesus Christ truly does restore. Immediately on the heels of his message and the experience of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, God through Peter is establishing a foundational principle. He's declaring to these people a first principle regarding the work of the Holy Ghost. Having been through what Paul would later in his letter to Titus call the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. God wanted these people who had experienced just that to know that there was more to the Pentecostal experience than salvation alone. But once you have been filled with the Spirit and you have been baptized in His name and your sins have been remitted, it is then that there is a healing work of the Holy Ghost that begins to be released in your mind, in your body, in your soul, in your spirit, in your marriage. It's released in your home. It's released in every part of who you are. It is the work of restoration. And so Peter, preaching this next layer message to them, instructs them to repent ye therefore and be converted. That means to be restored, to have your mind changed. And he said that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come in the presence of the Lord. Converted here speaks of the transitional action of restoration. Often men and women come into the church and we see them almost weekly filled with the Holy Ghost here at Pentecostal Tabernacle. We see them baptized in Jesus' name, but there are so many that stop right there. But that's not a destination point. That's just a gateway. That's a doorway into salvation. When you enter through that doorway, which is Jesus Christ, that doorway to the sheepfold, according to John chapter 10, it's the beginning of of a brand new life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You're born again of the water and of the Spirit. And when you take that first breath of the Holy Ghost and you begin to cry, Abba, Father, and your Spirit bears witness with His Spirit, it's not the end, brother. It's not the end, sister. It's just the beginning. Because the Holy Ghost is not just a saving Spirit. But the Holy Ghost is also a converting spirit. The Holy Ghost is not just a converting spirit. But Hebrews chapter 10 calls the Holy Ghost the spirit of grace. And it's the Holy Ghost that's going to give you the power to do what you have been anointed to do. Grace is that power to do the will of God. That's why Jesus said prophetically of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 that you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And it's going to give you the power to be a witness. It's going to give you the power to testify of the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. But I would propose to you tonight that the Holy Ghost is not just a saving power. And the Holy Ghost is not just a conversion power. The Holy Ghost is not just the spirit of grace and of healing. But God is a complete restorer. 
God will restore every part of your life. A carpenter can restore a building. And a body man or a mechanic can restore a car. And a chiropractor may be able to help you with your back a little bit, but Jesus Christ is the only one that can restore time. He said in the Old Testament, I will restore the years that the locust and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm have destroyed from. I want to tell you that when you come in here, God will take everything that the enemy meant for evil and he will completely restore it. That good will begin to unfold in your life and in your future. Somebody put your hands together if you believe the good word of the Lord tonight. God is a restorer. At a place called Cana in John chapter 2, Jesus performed his first miracle. That word Cana literally means a place of reeds. But when you take a deeper look into the name Cana, it is a place of measurement or a place of balance. It was at this place of balance and of measuring that Jesus Christ performed his first miracle The book of John chapter number 2 and that miracle was not an incidentally or coincidentally what it was. He turned the water into wine. And here what we're seeing is not just the first miracle of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. But prophetically we're seeing the first miracle of any life that comes into the body of Christ or the church, the kingdom of God. Here, encapsulated in this first miracle, we see a prophetic picture of Pentecost. The waters of man's present condition were replaced by the new wine of the Holy Ghost. Paul said of this wine of the Holy Ghost that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And so it was not just coincidence or happenstance that Mary, the mother, signifying the church that is the mother of us all, said to the servants, you do whatever he tells you. That's what we tell new believers when they come into the presence of God. You might not know what to do, but whatever he says to do, just go ahead and obey. And it's through the pathway of your obedience that there's going to be something that begins to change in your earthen vessel. And what used to be water is going to turn into a new wine of the Holy Ghost. I don't think it's an accident, Brother Castillo, that it happened to be a marriage supper. Water wasn't enough for that marriage supper, but there was wine that was required at the marriage supper. And there's going to come a day when water's not going to be enough for the marriage supper of the Lamb. But if you're going to be a part of the bride of the Christ, uh, then you're going to have to be filled uh, with the new wine of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I don't think it's an accident that the wine followed the water because it's after you've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ that Peter declared that you shall receive the gift uh, of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said to Nicodemus uh, that except a man be born again of the water first uh, and of the Spirit second. He's talking about the new wine of the Holy Ghost uh, that fills the vessel uh, of a human soul that then uh, you're going to gain entrance into the kingdom of God. It was a miracle. It was the first miracle. It's the first miracle that happened when you came into the church. You didn't have answers. All you had uh, was the water of unseen potential inside of you. But when you walked in the mother of the church that Paul says is the mother of us all spoke and the preacher preached and said whatever the Holy Ghost tells you to do go ahead and just be obedient to the Holy Ghost you feel it in here I want you just to begin to speak it out here and what may have began as English or Spanish began to change as you begin to speak in other tongues as the spirit began to give you the the utterance and you begin to gain entrance uh, into a brand new world. I'm 
preaching to you. That's the day that Jesus turned the water into wine. That's the day that the first miracle happened. It was when you came to your Cana, when you came to a measuring place, when you came to that atmosphere that was perfectly balanced, that Jesus said, I'm about to release the first revelation and dimension of unfolding prophetic demonstration in your life. I'm going to restore some things inside of you. However, you can be seated. That, that miracle at Cana was not the only miracle at Cana. Often ignored or glossed over, not seen in the pages of Scripture. That, there was another miracle that is recorded in the book of John chapter 4. Verse number 46, it tells us that Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee. Again, he's visiting this place of measurement. Again, he visits this place of balance. And there, it was said that it was where he made the water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And that nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. But Jesus said unto him in John 4 and verse 50, Go thy way, thy son liveth. All it took was a spoken word. And the man believed when that spoken word connected with the belief or the faith of that man, there was a miracle that was birthed in that moment. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And verse number 54 said, this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come to Judea of Galilee. God didn't just do a first miracle of salvation at Cana of Galilee, but it says that he did a second miracle, and that was a miracle of healing. We see that same pattern present in Acts 2 and verse 3. The first miracle at Pentecost was the water being turned into wine in the vessel of a new believer. And then the second miracle in Acts 3 was a man that was healed. And he began to walk when he had just been lying in a place that life had landed him at birth. And so here at Cana again, we see the same prophetic pattern. We see that the first miracle was water and wine and the second miracle was healing. And notice again what Jesus said in John 4 and verse 50. He said, go thy way, thy son liveth. This man's healing came because of his obedience. It was obedience uh, that turned the water into wine uh, and it was that same pathway of obedience uh, that led this nobleman to a place where healing visited his house. Uh, I want to tell you that not only will obedience uh, bring you to a restoration of salvation, but obedience uh, will bring you to the second dimension of restoration which is when you just believe the word that's preached and a man of God speaks in the pulpit and says go on home things are not going to be the same when you get there when you get home there are going to be detached some old spirits that have been hovering over you I want to tell somebody that if you will allow your faith out of your heart right now to begin to attach to the word of the Lord. It's not just the word of a preacher, but it's the word of God. And when you get home, you're going to walk into a second dimension of restoration and your family and your life is never going to be the same again. 
I feel like the power of the Lord is here to heal tonight. The word says that he sent his word and it healed them. I want to tell you that there's healing in your body that could happen in this house tonight. There's healing in your mind. Questions have plagued your mind. There are answers to be had in the atmosphere of the Holy Ghost that is in this room tonight. There is healing in your wounded spirit. That old abuse can come together and be mended tonight. All of the things that you've walked through, they were just an illustration to lead you to a place where God could bring you to the next dimension of restoration that he desires to do in you. He that began a good work in you is able to complete the work. I feel the preaching spirit of Pentecost on this pulpit right now. The Bible says that that same preaching spirit was on the apostle Peter. It didn't stop in Acts 2. It settled on him in Acts 3. But then again, we see it again upon him, Brother Jackson, in Acts chapter 10, that when he walked into Cornelius' house, that there was one dimension of restoration that was released by the word of the Lord, that while Peter yet spake, the Holy Ghost fell upon all them that but I feel that same anointing in this house right now I'm going to preach us into a revival I'm going to preach you into restoration we're going to see the word of the Lord released in 2024 and you're going to turn around and say hey he didn't just save me to save me but he saved me to restore me Lift up your hands all across this house and let those tongues begin to flow out of your spirit right now. I see it right now while I'm preaching to you that throughout the remainder of this year, there's going to be word after word that form layers like a blanket, and they're going to lay over your spirit. They're going to lay over your heart, and in the timing of God, they're going to melt like snow, and they're going to begin to permeate into the deepest parts of the soil of your heart so determine God whatever you're doing in this season I don't want to miss it whatever you're doing in this season I'm going to be a part of it I need every dimension of restoration that God has for my life Ezekiel chapter number 37 the prophet declared brother Ramon Aguilera that the hand of the Lord was upon me and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. Let me stop and tell you that when you surrender your heart to the hand of the Lord, that he can carry you places that you can't go in this temporal world. It says that he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. It's reminiscent of the book of Revelation where John says, I was in the spirit. On the Lord's day, it's what Paul was talking about when he says that we who are filled with the Holy Ghost are made to sit with him together in heavenly places. He said, I, I don't know whether it was in the body or out of the body, Paul said, but I was caught up into the third heaven. He's telling us that there are three heavens. The first heaven you can see by day, and you can see the clouds in the sky, but there's a heaven beyond that. And the second heaven you can only see by night. You can see the stars and the moon into the outer space, into the atmosphere of that second heaven. But I want to tell you that there's a heaven beyond that. There's a heaven that you can see by day, and there's a heaven that you can see by night. But when you get the Holy Ghost, you begin to see into a heaven that you can only see by faith. And when you get in that heavenly place, 
then God begins to show you things. God takes you into the land of eternal forms, of things that are there in heavenly existence, but they've not yet materialized in the tangibility of our daily life. It's where I got into and it's why God sent me to Kerman, California because 15 days in a fast I got together with God in a heavenly place and I, I, when I looked at it in the natural world it didn't make sense but I was in the land of invisible and complete forms where things are already complete they're just waiting on prayer I want to tell somebody that there's completion in this house it's just waiting on prayer. But when you pray, pray this way. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> mm. I believe that's a place where we need to get. I believe that that's a place where we don't just need to take a visitation. You don't just need to take the exit and have a gas station stop every once in a while in that dimension of the spirit. But I want to tell somebody that it's not a place that you press your way into. It's a place that you yield your way into. You begin to surrender your way into that. You begin to forget about the clock and you forget about the calendar and the schedule begins to fade out of your mind and all of the sudden you exit the chronos and you enter the land of the origin of those chiral logical moments in which God brings divine visitation to you and he supernaturally changes your life. That's how we got where we are today and that's how we're going to get where we're going tomorrow. I want to tell somebody here today that if you'll keep getting in that heavenly place then God's going to reveal what he has for you. Ezekiel got into that heavenly place and he said that the Lord set me down in the midst of a valley. And that valley was full of dry bones. And it he, he said the Lord caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many bones in that open valley. And lo, he said they were very dry. And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I want to take an examination of Ezekiel's response here, Brother Rusty Estes. He wanted to say yes, but his mind maybe wanted to say no. And he was caught in between two contrary opinions. And belief and unbelief can exist within the same spirit in the same time. This is why the man of the New Testament said, Lord, I believe, I want to believe in my spirit, but help thou mine unbelief. I've got flesh that I'm com contending with, and this is where Ezekiel was. So he answered, oh, Lord God, you know. I don't know, but you know, I don't trust in what I see or what I feel, but God, I, I do trust in you. Ezekiel seems to be torn in this moment as to whether or not God has the power to restore these bones. You, you have to remember these bones had lived. They are formerly alive bodies. They had lived. Perhaps Ezekiel could have remembered when these bones lived, but these bones were the memories of yesterday's life and yesterday's successes and yesterday's ultimate failure. And so he, he remembers that, yes, these bones have lived, but within Ezekiel there is an argument that is taking place. His flesh is saying it's a boneyard, but there's something in his spirit that's getting stirred up at the words of God and declaring, no. It's an exceeding great army, and I'm preaching to somebody right now that you're in the valley of dry bones, and you're wondering if God's able to really restore. 
and there's there, your, your, your sight says that it's a boneyard, but I came with the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of the Lord, I came to link up with your faith. I came to draw a Lord you know out of you. I came to tell you it's not just a boneyard. And the best days are not behind you. But there's some coming that you can't see it by the light of the first heaven. And you can't see it in the darkness of the second heaven. You can only see it when you walk by faith that's going to take you into that heavenly realm of wholeness and completion. Mm. And so that same argument's happening. It's happening in you. It was happening in Ezekiel. It was happening in those that, uh, the minds of those that saw what took place in our text in Acts chapter number three. And there's a debate between the nostalgia of yesterday's religious tradition and the rising future of the kingdom of God. And so Peter declares, not only does God want to save you, yeah, he's a restorer of salvation, but he also wants to heal you, yeah, but that's not all he wants to do. He said, there's coming a time of the restoration of all things. There's going to come a return of Jesus Christ that will restore mankind and the earth from its complete fallen condition. He was saying, there's not just two dimensions of restoration, but there's a higher dimension that's coming. There's a dimension beyond your healing, but God wants to restore you to a place of kingdom ministry. He desires to see you as an active participant in the rise of the kingdom. When I, when Sister Sanders and I came to this valley four years ago, we stepped out of our car into the middle of an argument. It wasn't between she and I, but there was an argument that was taking place in the spirit among men and women, saints and pastors in this valley. And the argument was this, are we going to live in yesterday's boneyard of the nostalgia of the religious tradition and know that they used to live, but we're not sure that we could ever see them live it again. But God was asking, he was saying, can these bones live again. Oh yeah. And so in this valley, there's a restoration of Pentecost, but there's a miracle beyond that restoration. That's that first dimensional restoration. In this valley, what we've been watching for four years is that there's been a second dimension of restoration. That's why some of you are in this house healthy because not only did he save your soul, but he healed your marriage. Not only did he save your soul, but he's been healing your family. But I came with the spirit of Ezekiel tonight to declare that there's another dimension that's coming to this valley. And it's not just a salvation restoration and a healing restoration, but there is a restoration of all things. He's going to restore the years. He's going to restore the unit. He's going to restore the power and the demonstration. There's going to be a restoration of the gifts of healing and of the word of prophecy. There's going to be the restoration of all things. That's what God's leading us into in 2024, brothers and sisters. He's saying, don't look at the boneyard of yesterday and get caught up in all that religious tradition. We thank God for the bones, but the thing is that you can get a little close to the bone and the most satisfaction you're going to get out of the bone is just a memory. You could say, but at least I still got a piece of this or I got to, are you going to settle the rest of your life, live in your ministry in pieces, or are you going to and allow God to begin to puzzle those things back together by the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to prophesy to you right now that God is going to bring a restoration of all things. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things become new. 
Mm. And so there's a spirit of kingdom restoration that God is releasing in this church. We've had a spirit of healing. We've had a spirit of salvation restoration. I think last year we probably had at least 100 people get the Holy Ghost. We don't even count. We just know that they don't last without the Holy Ghost in this atmosphere very long. But then they walk in. If they're hungry and they repent, we've got faith. And if they've got faith, we'll release the word, lay our hands upon them, which is a foundational doctrine of the New Testament church. And the Lord said, if you get the foundation in place, then I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We've seen we've seen hundreds get the Holy Ghost. We've seen multitudes get baptized. Brother Rusty Estes, we can all stand as a body and say we've seen them get healed. We've seen them get healed in their mind. We've seen them get healed in their marriage. We've seen them get healed in their marriage. And I'm telling you, that's going to continue. But there's something greater for PT. There's something greater that's rising. I feel a kingdom dominion that's beginning to rise. There's going to be the entrance into the restoration of all things. And it's here. It's right now. It's already been released, but it's being released. It's like we're opening the faucet just a little bit more tonight, Brother Matheny. It's been flowing. We've got property, and God's been doing some things. But we're about to see all things restored. We're about to see the full. There's going to be a return to the Book of Acts church. God's looking for a place to restore all things. He's looking for a place where there's humility and where there's open. Openness, and where there's healing and where truth is not compromised and where holiness is still there I want to tell God right now that Lord if you're looking for anywhere in this season look right here look in this house look right now we're crying out unto you we're asking you to restore all things And I want to take it down to you and tell you don't be satisfied to sit on a pew saved. That's only a first dimensional mentality. Oh, yes, that's restoration and we rejoice in it. But don't you dare be satisfied to sit on a pew saved. Don't let the gospel end with you. Somebody shared it with you. Go ahead and share it with somebody else. He blessed you to be a blessing. And he said, I'm going to bless them that bless you. That means that there's a promise that if you'll share with somebody else, God's going to bless you. I, I know that God's going to fill all my kids with the I got three that don't have the Holy Ghost yet, but I already know it's coming. Why? Because I'm pouring out, Brother Jackson. I'm pouring out, Sister Maria. And he said, if you'll pour out and be a blessing, then I'm going to be a blessing to you. I want to tell somebody right now that God wants to take you beyond the restoration of salvation and God wants to take you beyond the restoration of your healing but if you're not careful you boom while I'm preaching just hit a brick wall because your infirmity becomes your identity and you become the man we don't even know his name we know him as the man with the withered hand his infirmity was his identity and we know the lame man I feel the Holy Ghost on what I'm preaching to you right now brother Bobby we know the lame man 38 years he's been lying at the pool of Bethesda we don't know his name but his identity has become his infirmity we don't know her name but for 12 years she'd had an issue of blood Blood. Her identity had become her infirmity. We don't know her name, but for 18 years, she had been bowed over with what the Bible says was a spirit of infirmity. And that spirit of infirmity had begun to dictate her identity. But God never
never intended, hear me in the Holy Ghost right now, God never intended for you to be known by your divorce. God never intended for you to be known by your disease. God never intended for you to be known as the guy that got kicked out of that church. Don't allow that spirit of the infirm to get on you because when you do, you get caught in the clasp of a second dimension ministry. But when you say, God, I'm not completed by what they said about me, I'm completing you. It's at that point where your infirmity is no longer your identity, but his restoration is your new identity. And we are hid in Christ with God. And we are complete in him. And that's the guy that he took a licking, but the Holy Ghost helped him. And he kept on taking He's not known by his infirmity, but now he's known by the grace and the mercy of his God. I'm preaching somebody out of your out of your rut right now. A rut isn't anything more than a grave with both ends knocked out. Why sit we here until we die? It's time to rise up into our kingdom identity. I want to tell you, it's the best isn't behind you, Brother Granado, but the best is here and the best is yet to come because I see that there's another dimension of restoration and it's the restoration of all things and so I'm about to go into the enemy's camp and I'm going to take back 30% of what he stole from me Oh yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna rely on one message on a Wednesday night, that's about where you're gonna live, but you gotta get something in your spirit from heaven. I'm going to the enemy's camp and I'm taking back 48% of what he's no no no. Your infirmity is 52% of your identity. I'm going to the enemy's camp and I'm taking 80% of what he stole from me. No, 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 no. Let me tell you something. 80% others might view that as a success. But God doesn't have an A, B, C, D, and F grading system, buddy. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be who God called you to be, then you're gonna have to go into the enemy's camp and take back everything that is stole from you and say, I'm not settling for salvation I'm not settling for healing I didn't come here to just take the Lord's side but by his power I came to take dominion and I'm putting it under my feet and so in closing as we stand tonight We make our third visit to Cana. The final visit to Cana of Galilee recorded in Scripture, the first, was a salvation visitation. The second was a dimension of healing. But then the third we read in John 21... After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee. In whom there was no guile. Why? Because he was restored. He was saved. But more than that, he was healed. And now he's listed in the pantheon of apostles as being a man that had been f restored fully to ministry. 
Holy Ghost, drop this word in my spirit about 4 o'clock. And I've preached it to you the best of way I know how to preach. But I want to tell you, God's got a third visit to Cana for somebody in this house. There's a restoration of all things coming your way. I'm going to open these altars right now. There's a restoration of all things that's coming to your home. I need a, pia a keyboard player up here. We're just going to play right now. Brother Sergio, if you could help me. There's a restoration of all things. All things. Not 80%. Not 60%. Not 40%. <laughs> And I know, I know it's talking about the, the eternal kingdom. But he's going to do it in part right now in the lives of men and women. We are prophetic of that eternal kingdom. And so if he's going to restore all things there, by the power of the Holy Ghost, we can see all things restored. Scripture says that believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I want you to reach over and lay hands of restoration on somebody around you. I want everybody in the house who's praying to begin to look up. Don't look down. Don't look down at where you've been living. Don't look down at where you've been walking, but look up. Look up. Your redemption's here. That word redemption is another word for restoration. Look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. 2024, the restoration of all things. Coming to California. 2024, the restoration of all things. Coming to Pentecostal Tabernacle. 2024, the restoration of all things. Coming to your life, Sister Victoria. 2024, Brother Mark. Brother Joel. For the Cody, the restoration, Sister Samantha, of all things, all things, all things. Don't make a deal. Don't make a truce. Don't make a treaty with the enemy and say, you know what? You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. No, no, no. That's not everything. You say, I'm going to draw a line. And you better not cross that line, but I'm going to cross it. And I'm going into the enemy's camp. And I'm taking back everything, everything, everything. I would to God that there be an all things mentality that settled. Come on, everything. Not everything except my kids, Brother Matheny. Everything. Not everything except my grand. Everything. Not everything except my health. Everything. 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 All things. That's it, Sister Maria. Let the Holy Ghost move. Let the Holy Ghost move. All things. Brother Victor, Sister Yenny, let the Holy Ghost move. All things. He's a restorer of all things. All things. Sister Christine, all things. Brother Tepete, all things. Vincent, everything. Everything. We're going to be complete in him. I'm not going to heaven limping. I've made up my mind. I'm not barely going to just limp through those pearly gates. But I'm going to give the devil a bad day, Brother Aguilera, because we're going to get all things. We're going to see the restoration of all things. Father, I pray over this beautiful anointed church body. I pray that your anointing, your anointing to repossess things, callings that they have been evicted from, the enemy has taken those things and has become a squatter in those ministries. But we're taking it back. We're knocking the door down. We're going to evict the enemy from our thinking and we're taking back everything. Everything, everything, everything. Can these bones live? Ezekiel wasn't sure, so he said, Lord, you know. But Brother Loera, the Lord just began to tell him what to do. 
Ezekiel didn't know how to put a bone together. Ezekiel didn't know how to put sinew and flesh on those bones. But God did. And it was the same obedience that took you to salvation. And the same obedience that's taken you to a place of healing. That's the obedience that brought the restoration of all things in that valley. How many times have things worked, but we got comfortable and we stopped doing what got us here? It's not time to stop obeying God, but you obey God to the point of salvation, to the point of healing, and to that final dimension of the restoration of all things. Would you reach over and connect with somebody right now and let's take a full minute just pray as led by the Holy Ghost for those around you we got a new elder in the church brother Jerry Johnson why restoration of all things all things I'm not leaving a dollar in the devil's camp. I'm not leaving an offense over there. I'm going to burn it on the altar. I'm going to restore all, see God restore all things. He make all things new. Mm. Uh. Sometimes we think that God's restoration process has got to be a complete overhaul overnight. How many months has it taken, brothers, for us to get to this place in the restoration of this building? Restoration takes time. But you know, if the drywall guys didn't show up, the restoration would be a little less complete than it is today. And if the painter guys didn't show up, and if the lighting technicians didn't show up, we'd be missing some pieces. And so it would drag the restoration out longer. That's what happens when you miss divine appointments with God. I understand that there are circumstances that may at times prohibit me from being in the house of the Lord. But Brother Rusty, you and I both know that the whole key to this thing. I want you to say it one more time. Just keep showing up. Just keep showing up because you never know. God might be healing hearts tonight. And then you come next week. He's working on memories. Come the following week and he's dealing with spouses. Come the next week, he's, he's handling kids. If you only come to three out of four, two out of five, that restoration is going to take longer. Because we get this misnomer in our mind that restoration is just immediate. But Brother Booker was talking about, and I've read the book, it's called, it's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he gives the illustration of the cycling team, the national cycling team of the nation of England. And they were they were terrible. They didn't win. They were last place often. But they began to do what are called, Brother Tapete, 1% improvements. And so they got a variety of bicycle seats, and they had the team try them out, and they improved the bicycle seat. And then they revisited the, trans, the transport of the bikes and they realized that dust was getting in the gears the way they were doing it so they sterilized their system to where no dust would get in the gears. They 
They optimized the uniform that they were wearing. And would you know that the next year, they were the champion cycling team in the world. Why? Because though restoration didn't just happen overnight, it wasn't as far as they thought it was. No, it's not going to happen overnight, but I want to tell you, I want to leave you with a word of encouragement. You're closer than you realize. So don't give up now. You're closer than you realize, so don't give up now. Amen. One more time, why don't we thank Jesus for his touch in this room tonight. Father, we thank you for our church family tonight. We thank you for all of those who have felt led by you to come here. I pray that you will minister blessing to them. Lord, would you just bat away all those birds of prey that will try to steal the seed of the word of the Lord from the soil of our hearts. But God, would you hedge that word. We want it to be buried deep. Let it resurface in just the moment when we need to remember and recall this word tonight. Lord, I just want to stop and say thank you for my church family. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. But if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have those hands of blessing upon my life. Lord, the hands of the body of Christ, those are anointed hands. I pray, Lord, that you would bless everything that your people touch. That when they lay hands on the sick, it shall recover. When they put hands to the plow, that they won't look back. When they lift up those hands, let them be holy hands without wrath or doubting. Let them be blessed hands. For the hands of your people are the nail-scarred hands of the body of Christ. I thank you for this church family. Amen. If you don't remember anything that I told you tonight, I'll tell you two things. Number one, go back and listen to the recording. Number two, remember this. I love you. And Jesus loves you. And if you got a pastor that loves you and you have a God that loves you, you can make it through everything. Amen. So I love you and Jesus loves you. Go forth. Be blessed this week. Don't be, don't be surprised when God just starts blessing. All right? Don't be allergic to blessing. God's going to bless you. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.